The idea of photogrammetry is very appealing because we can get very realistic models, fully textured, fully unwrapped, and all from a few photos. And the computer does all the heavy lifting for us. This is intriguing. So over the last couple of weeks, I set out on a journey to find the right workflow to make this work. But what did I find? How easy was it really to do photogrammetry? And is it a workflow that makes sense for day-to-day -day use in ArcVis? Stick with me to find out what I learned. In this video, I'll show you a good and free workflow for doing your own photogrammetry. And hopefully you can learn from my mistakes and avoid a lot of the pitfalls that I've experienced while on this journey. At the end, I'll show you my results and share with you my thoughts about photogrammetry in general. And then of course, as usual, I want to hear from you and what your thoughts are and maybe what your experiences have been with photogrammetry. Give me a like if you're interested in learning more about photogrammetry for ArcVis. And as always, please subscribe if you enjoy these exploratory videos and if you like learning about ArcVis topics because I have so much more stuff coming up in the near future. So first and foremost, the biggest thing is to capture good photos. This is a huge, huge part of it, and you gotta get this part right. And you can see that at first, I was trying to cheat. I actually used a video on my phone and just filmed all around this thing, and then captured every couple of frames using After Effects. I just set the frame rate to something really low, I think one, so it captured every 30th frame, giving me photos. But of course, this didn't work. There's no way to cheat this. You can see there's some blurring going on. That's never gonna work. I tried to set up a turntable, bought a crappy turntable off Amazon, put a little plastic guy on there, put the camera in one place and rotated. And this actually works. You can do the whole rotation thing, but the background has to be perfect. It needs to be basically like a solid color and not change. But the problem with that one is the plastic. The plastic was too hard to scan. There isn't enough detail and Meshroom couldn't pick it up. I tried an apple on a spigot with a bite out of it. I tried it without a bite on it, bite out of it. This one actually worked the best, as you'll see. Plastic Man never worked, no matter what I did. Didn't matter all the different techniques I tried. So there's some basic rules that you really need to follow in order to get good pictures. You'll see here, obviously it needs to be well lit. You have to avoid shadows, reflections, transparent, transparent objects. That's like the, the plastic, it's too reflective and doesn't have enough detail in it. Take the photos in diffused lighting, indirect lighting, so like overcast day outside or multiple light sources inside. You can't just have like a direct shadow on the thing. You can't use the flash. Don't change the focal length, so it's best to use a fixed focal length on your camera. Try to take pictures from every angle. This is where I fail a lot because I'm not patient enough. Can't move the objects, background can't move. So all this stuff is legit. I, tr I experienced every one of these problems. If you don't follow this very carefully, then you're not gonna get re good results. So with the rotating rig, make sure to use plain colored background. The object of interest should always fill most of the image. Take images with side overlap of 60% minimum and frontal overlap of 80% minimum. For each shot, move to a new position or rotate the object. Do not take multiple images from the same spot. For better coverage, you can photograph an area multiple times in different acquisition patterns. Avoid shaky, blurky, blurry, warped images. And you'll see Meshroom will actually reject blurry or warped images. It will not feature into your calculations. And the more images you have, the better. Always filter out repetitive or poor quality images to reduce processing time. So all these things are totally true. You have to follow this stuff to a T or else you are not going to get results, good results. So the picture taking part is the most important part. The rest is easy as you'll see. Make sure and take good photos. Follow all these rules. I didn't do that. I messed up a whole bunch of times and I did not get good results. And you'll see that the best results came when I followed all these rules. So this will take a little bit of practice and a little bit of trial and error, but you need to get this part right. You also see though that some objects just aren't really scannable. My plastic man, he would not scan. The back of him never worked, no matter how I tried to do it. The front of him worked great, the back did not, because there's not enough definition 
and the plastic is too smooth and reflective, it just wouldn't scan. Keep that in mind. Okay, let's look real quick in Meshroom and see how this all works. That's the next part of this, Meshroom. Meshroom download. You actually get download links from various different sites. This one works, alishvision.org, and you just need to download it for your particular operating system. Try Meshroom now. Windows Meshroom right there. That's what I got. Inside Meshroom, it looks like this, and you have, it's kind of node-based, so you have all your different nodes, all the different things that it needs to figure out down here at the bottom. And we'll go through each one of these and it'll give you progress. If you hit start, it'll give you a progress bar for each one of these. Or as you'll see, you can right click on one of these and compute and it will come just to that point and then stop. So first things first, you gotta get pictures in here. You can drop a folder in here or any selection of images that you've got. Okay, I have this collection here of Apple images and this is the one that worked the best. This is the one with the Apple up on a elevated spigot so I could get underneath of it a little bit. So I can actually just take this whole folder and drag it into Meshroom like this. And you'll notice that those are in raw format and that's okay. Meshroom can understand that. And also in another important note is with the video when I export out of After Effects, there it was generating JPEGs, but they did not have the EXIF data with it. So Meshroom didn't know my focal length and all those kind of things and my exposure settings. But if I bring in this, the raw files directly, then it does know all those things. And that has a probably a higher probability of working. It can figure it out without the EXIF data, but it the more info you know about the pictures, the easier time it's gonna have figuring it out. So I recommend doing it that way, making sure you have that data connected to your images. But it'll bring these all in. And once you have all your photos in here, you just need to start running these nodes down here. So there's kind of two big waypoints in the nodes down here. You know, it'll it'll do all this information and create a structure from motion. So that just that generates all your points and also shows where all your cameras would be in 3D space. It actually finds where each camera shot was taken from and shows the cameras here in 3D, which is cool. And then the next major step is depending on if you want to mesh with materials, you can go all the way to here. If you don't need the texturing part, then you can just go to here and create these meshes. So let's go to the structure from motion part first. We can just say compute. And for this stuff, you can pretty much just use the default settings here, compute. You need to save your file first and it'll show all green. It'll give you this. Okay, there's that apple sitting there. Pretty awesome. And it shows where each camera was taken from. And you can see, this one was my best results, but it could still be better. You can see that I there's there's more camera shots I could have taken. I could have done more overlap, especially on the bottom pictures. And the lighting was not good on the bottom, and so that didn't work as well as the rest. But these are the kind of issues that you run into when doing photo scanning. So this is the kind of stuff you need to use trial and error to get it just right. Now, if you go all the way to texturing, you can see here there's some things you might want to adjust in let's see in the mesh filtering you could say keep only the largest mesh so if you have things going on in the background it's not getting computed and added to your model here it's just grabbing the apple only in theory you can set the max points of your mesh here so so determine how complex your mesh is going to be i basically just leave all this stuff how it is and then in texturing you have the texture size and texture downscale so you can you can downscale it by multiple here. Default is set to two. Okay, then you can right click on this and compute it. And you will see that it gives you a progress bar, the yellow, the blue is what it's going to work on. This part takes probably the longest time, especially as it gets down here to the texturing part. So this is where you might have to wait for a while. Once you've calculated all the way to the end here, you have the option now. I mean, you can click down here and it'll give you the full textured version. You can turn it on and off over here. The structure from motion looked like this. The textured version looking like this. Okay, and you can see it is not perfect, but it gives us pretty good results. Wireframe looks like this, pretty complicated. See, it's more dense in some places and less dense in others. So of course it's gonna be less accurate in those less dense places. And we can take this into max and clean it up, make it a little bit more efficient model. You can see obviously it's having a hard time with the stem up there because it's so fine, very hard to pick up without getting very good 
pictures. So from this node, we can find our mesh. Okay, so this is the mesh with the full texture on it. So if we hit Control A and then Control C, and then go to, okay, somehow I grabbed the wrong mesh. I actually wanna be in here. This goes into the meshroom cache under texturing. So mesh filtering is gonna give you the meshes without the texture. I want the ones with the texture. Let's check in meshroom again. Oh, I grabbed the wrong mesh before. You wanna you want to scroll down and grab this mesh down here. So control A, control C. It takes me to here. It should be under meshroom cache texturing and then take the tester, textured mesh OBJ. That's the one you want. Bring that one in. There we go. Okay, so of course I can just go in here and start cleaning some things up. No real way to get rid of that, that spike that my apple was sitting on. Not so much I can do about that either, except model it in myself. Okay, so again, not perfect, but it will work for demonstration purposes. In the wireframe, it looks like this, super heavy. So the good news is that 3ds Max now has really good retopo tools that are automatic, and they will preserve our UVs. Okay, so we can actually retopologize using the modifier retopology. And other 3D software programs have this too. And we can set our face count to, let's say, how, how big are we willing to let an apple be? 15,000, 20,000. And we want to use UV channel one because the UV unwrap is on UV channel one. And then we just compute it and it'll keep our material and our unwrap perfectly nicely, which is fantastic. Probably my favorite new feature of 3ds Max 2023 is the retopology tools. Fantastic for photo scanning, makes it much better, and I've actually found it useful for a bunch of other things too. This part of the process may take a little while as well. Okay, so after retopology, it looks like that. Maybe still a little heavy on the polygons. There's a few weird spots, so you can go in and clean this kind of stuff up. Really, I just need a better scan, but taking some of these spikes and growing the selection and then using the relax tool, the relax modifier. Okay, so you can relax parts of it like that. Convert it again to edit poly. Okay, after we get our mesh in and we clean it up how we want, we have our textures correct and retopo everything then we're ready to just use the apples in our scene. And like I said, they're not perfect, but the results are pretty good. And I'll give you my take after this on photogrammetry in general. Hopefully you're learning a little bit of what not to do and what you need to be able to do in order to get good results by seeing my results. That's the process. It just takes some patience and you gotta be real careful about how you take your pictures the rest of the process is kind of done for you by the computer. So the combination of Meshroom, being able to figure everything out, and then the Retopo tools in 3ds Max or other 3D software, this combo makes it pretty reasonable to be able to do this. The only question is what kind of results you can get. So what is my overall thoughts about photogrammetry? Well, photogrammetry is not as easy as it might seem. Like I said in the beginning, very appealing idea, but in practice, it's not as easy as I'd like it to be. You need a very good setup for the photography. You need the lighting to be perfect. You need your rig or however it is you're setting up your model to be just right. Each object can pose different challenges. Some objects will work better than other objects. Objects can't be too glossy. They can't be lacking in definition, I found. The background matters. How the camera relates or how your object relates to all the things around it those things matter so the camera can figure things out so the software can figure things out there are a ton of things that will cause your model to be less than perfect now do we have time to troubleshoot all these things for every different object that we want to scan i don't know what my recommendation is and what my thought was while doing this is if this is a generic object like an apple for example i'm just gonna buy this because some guy on the internet has already found or already created the perfect scan of an apple and he'll sell it to me for way less than the cost of what it would cost me to do it myself so i always recommend buying models if they're out there 
because of that very reason. However, that's for generic models. We don't always have that luxury. Sometimes we need things that are very specific or custom. So for highly custom objects that are too complex to model or at least model easily, this is where photogrammetry plays an important role in my opinion. So let's use an example. You're rendering an outdoor plaza and in the center of that plaza, you have a gigantic sculpture that needs to be represented perfectly in 3D in the renderings. Now, how could you do this? You can, you can poly model it. You could maybe sculpt it in ZBrush or something. Those things are really hard and that, that workflow is harder than photogrammetry, let's be honest. And getting it accurate would require a bunch of photographs anyway and a bunch of measurements and things like that. It'd be super hard. So I think photogrammetry, this is where it comes in. This, the photogrammetry has got to be the best way to do that, right? So full disclosure at, in my full-time job, I have actually used it in this exact application several times. And even without knowing what I'm doing, even without having gone through this whole process of finding the best workflow, I've still gotten good results doing that. So this is a perfect example of where photogrammetry is is really vital for some ArcViz applications. So I'm super happy that photogrammetry has become widespread, easily accessible, and there's things like Meshroom out there that are free because for that specific application, it's indispensable, right? So it's important that we figure out the process, we know at least the basics of how to do it, and that we're capable of capturing a high enough quality photo scan that we can do things like that with when that specific scenario arises or other scenarios where photogrammetry is the best option. So what are your thoughts? Have you used photogrammetry successfully before? Maybe you've had more success than I have. What tips and tricks do you have for me and for the other viewers of this video? What is your workflow? What does it look like? It's similar to what I was experimenting with in this video. What are your thoughts on the general usefulness of photogrammetry? These are all things I'm interested to hear from you. Let me know in the comments. And finally, like this video if you've used photogrammetry in the past or if you think you might use it in the future. And please subscribe if you like these kind of videos. Like I said, I have so many more coming up. And let me know in the comments what you'd be interested in learning about, what you want me to explore for you guys. Thanks for watching, as always.